hold them. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Michael Brunt, Professor of Surgery, uh, Surgery at Washington University in St. Louis. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Chang and Dr. G and Dr. Jones, for inviting me to speak here. If I can have my slides up, please. So um, what I uh, chose to do is to break this down into a series of steps, and maybe I, it's to the extreme, but I didn't want to take anything uh, for granted as uh, we were going through this. Let me move the slides. This, these are my uh, disclosures, none of which uh, relate to the content of this talk. So um, you probably already know this already, but I think one of the first keys is really a patient to position. Um, and the key here is to tuck the arms. Patient supine, of course, but tuck the arms. And, and so this allows you to stand high enough up, really up, up by the chest almost, so that when you're working down towards the feet, looking at the hernia space, that you're in an ergonomically friendly and comfortable uh, position. Um, and sometimes we'll stand on the same side, sometimes on the opposite side. I'm going to talk about the extra perineal approach and exactly how we do that. The patient, once we get everything in, is typically in a slight Trendelenburg position, and we are typically standing on the side opposite of uh, the hernia. Can you just click on the bottom video real quick? Just uh, You kind of see one of us is holding uh, the camera, and the, uh, the other is um, uh, doing the uh, dissection uh, two-handed. Uh, this is uh, our uh, MIS fellow, Nate Stoics, who uh, uh, was involved in these cases and uh, did, along with Peggy Frisella, did the video editing for this, uh, for this uh, presentation. Now, the second thing, this, I bet this is something that most of you don't do, uh, <laughs> but this is the scrotal wrap, okay? And uh, you all laugh, but this is how you avoid pneumoscrotum. How many, I learned this from one of the urologists many years ago in the early days of lapar laparoscopy for anything you do in the preperitoneal space. How many of you have used this technique? A, a couple. How many of you see a tremendous amount of swelling around the scrotum in that area after almost all of you? Do the scrotal wrap. You won't see that pneumoscrotum at the end of the case. So um, um, I would encourage you to do that. It, it, the the uh, devil's in the details. You don't want to wrap this too tight, of course. <laughs> so it'd be a nice, gentle scrotal wrap, and, uh, and uh, be sure to remember to take it off at the end of the case. So, <laughs> so uh, let's talk about access a little bit. Um, uh, I'm just showing the incision here. This is a curved uh, incision just a little bit below the umbilicus. If you're buried in the umbilicus, it's a little bit hard to get to that sheath. Um, and then uh, a lot of this is blunt dissection right down to the anterior rectus sheath. The camera's positioned below uh, where we're going here. And then we just open up the anterior rectus sheath, okay? I think the key to TEP hernia repair are these initial steps here, getting your, uh, making your space and getting everything in the right spot. And then we, we use these uh, S retractors. You can see the posterior sheath there. And then I take a, a peon type clamp and I just pass it along that posterior sheath, kind of angled up anteriorly a little bit. If you angle posteriorly, you can pop through the peritoneum below the arcuate line. This just opens that up, maybe breaks up a couple of little adhesions before you try to put the uh, balloon dissector in place. And so here's the uh, balloon now going in place. The S retractors are in uh, along the rectus sheath. And oftentimes there's a little bit of a lip on this balloon. You have to very kind of carefully slide that in. It's angled up anteriorly. I like to take the tip go down and basically kind of tap the, the uh, pubis, and then I duck it under the pubis just slightly, go in another centimeter or two, and that's all, and then uh, you're ready to uh, inflate the space. And so uh, we're inflating uh, here, as you can see, and we do this under direct laparoscopic vision. I couldn't figure out how to get the two videos to play at the same time, but you're watching this as you go, um, and uh, it's a key that the inferior epigastric vessels stay up anteriorly um, as, um, as you're doing this. And typically there's a hand down on the contralateral side kind of pushing over to make sure that you get um, a, a full dissection on the side of the hernia. If it's a bilateral hernia, I tend to insert the balloon along the side uh, where the larger hernia is, but you could start on uh, either side. Okay. And this is really one of the uh, it, uh, huge advantages of using an extra peritoneal approach. Uh, the balloon does a lot of the dissection, particularly if you've got a direct hernia. Um, and I think, uh, just like Dr. Schweitzberg does TEPs in males, I think once you TEP, you won't go back to TEP, except for select uh, situations. 
So then uh, we have to switch the balloon out. There are devices where you don't have to switch. I found them a little cumbersome, so I usually switch out for a balloon tip uh, cannula. We inflate the balloon and then inflate the space. Um, and if you can uh, click on the video on the right side, and then uh, we watch the space uh, gradually open up. Um, and here you can see we've got a pretty good dissection. You can actually see a bit of the peritoneum posterior, and of course you can see the muscle uh, that is uh, anteriorly there. And typically I start with 15 millimeters of mercury pressure until I get all my ports in, and then I will often lower it a bit to about uh, 15 millimeters of mercury. Now, um, there are a number of different uh, port configurations that you can use. Most commonly, I will uh, uh, ladder the uh, trocars from the umbilicus uh, down toward the pubis. But if I have somebody who's got a short uh, uh, trunk, uh, particularly a short distance between the umbilicus and the pubis, then I'll put one midline port. I'll dissect the space out laterally a bit further, and then I will put that second port in as high and lateral as I can go into the preperitoneal space. Um, uh, so that uh, that lower port is not too close to the pubis because if it's too close, uh, it's fine for the dissection, but it's going to make it a little more difficult to uh, get your mesh uh, positioned uh, properly. So uh, here we're just uh, putting in the accessory uh, ports. Of course, I do this under direct vision. These are uh, five millimeter ports. Um, I, I try to be very cost conscious, and I used to use uh, reusable trocars here, but when you're working two-handed and you're in and out a lot, they'd end up slipping and coming out, and so I like to use a port that has a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a grip on it, whatever that may be, and click on the right video. And then here you can just, sometimes they're, you want them to be below your camera port, but not much below, and as much as possible to come through the midline so that you're not coming through so much of the rectus muscle, because then that movement back and forth, I think, creates a little more trauma and potentially a little more uh, pain and, uh, and uh, bleeding risk. So you really want to try to have those right in the midline as much as possible. And then um, the next step is to finish dissecting out this uh, space bluntly. I usually start where I have a landmark, uh, such as the, uh, the, the pub superior ramus of the pubis there. You can see right where the midline symphysis of the pubis is. And just like Dr. Schweitzberg showed you, this is all pretty much a blunt dissection. I think this is... Uh, one of the reasons that there's a bit of a learning curve, because really the, the section technique is different than most anywhere else that we work in uh, laparoscopic surgery. And if you can click uh, on that video. And now what we're doing is uh, we are expanding the lateral space. And so <clears throat> uh, I think the key uh, here is to stay up uh, on the lateral abdominal wall. And I usually, once I start to get that open, I'll take my left hand, push up on the abdominal wall, and then sweep laterally. If you aggressively sweep down here, this peritoneum is almost always tethered over at that right lateral corner. And I think that's a common a place where you can get into the peritoneal cavity at this stage. And if, you do, if that happens early in the dissection, then you end up getting pneumoperitoneum. And can you just run that video one more time? Pneumoperitoneum. And then that compromises your working space, and it just makes uh, the, the rest of the operation from that uh, point on a lot more difficult. Uh, you can I think you can also see uh, from this uh, lateral dissection here that there would be ample room to put an accessory port out there if you chose to do that instead of uh, putting uh, all of your ports up in the midline. But you do have to be careful with that little lateral edge. Sometimes I'll actually cut that uh, sharply because I think you're at greater risk of getting a hole in the peritoneum if you continue to do uh, the blunt dissection. But that's usually the sticking point right about there. And now we've got enough lateral dissection. There should be plenty of room to put the mesh in so that you don't, um, uh, you don't have to go any further with that. And, of course, here's the inferior epigastric vessels uh, landmark. Okay? Now, this patient has an indirect sac. I'm going to show an indirect and direct both. Um, and um, if you can... Uh, the, uh, what I try to do is, I think uh, a lot of times when we're working with the uh, residents, what they try to do is just pull everything right out of the canal, and that usually doesn't work. And so what I try to do is, just like you would in dissecting out an open sac, peel all these little vessels and everything off the sac. Peel them out laterally. You've got to work back and forth and gradually work so that you almost get a window around uh, the sac. The vast deference, is, this is on the right side, so the vast deference is going to be over here. And then you just kind of gradually march this uh, sack down and out, hand over hand. It's, uh, it's all a blunt uh, technique. I think the other thing that commonly happens is people grab too much tissue and try to separate it. 
it's almost like um, if you had a, 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 a ball of cotton and you're trying to tease it apart. If you grab a big piece of it, it's not going to come apart. But you just gradually tease the fibers apart and uh, eventually uh, get your sack out. I think the indirect sacks are certainly a lot more difficult uh, than the direct sacks, and especially a big, long indirect sack. But here you can see the peritoneal reflection here, and there's the stromatic cord with the vessels and the vas uh, deferens there. And then uh, the other uh, aspect of this is I try to make sure that I've peeled this back uh, about five to six centimeters proximal to the internal ring because you don't want to leave peritoneum up underneath the edge of your mesh. Whether you've got a direct hernia or indirect hernia you're repairing, that could potentially be a source of uh, recurrence uh, down the road. So this is a good a point in time now that you've really done the dissection to step back, review your anatomy. And in fact, I think if any, at any point in the operation that you feel like you're not sure what's going on, it's always a good idea to just step back. Let's look and let me reorient myself to the landmarks because you're in this extra peritoneal space. You don't have the big view that you get in the peritoneal cavity. And so let's just review on this schematic real quickly. The midline, here's the rectus that you're going to see, the superior ramus of the pubis with the Cooper's ligament right on top of that. Of course, the inferior epigastrics, iliopubic tract, uh, which forms the anterior medial boundaries of the femoral cal, the indirect space with the cord <coughs> structures, and of course the iliac femoral vessels here direct space, indirect space. So if you can click on the video, and we'll just take this. So here's the midline symphysis. Cooper's ligament's going to be right here. This is, this is iliopubic tract, again, and this is the femoral space right here. You want to look at that, but you've got to be careful about pulling nodal tissue out of there, which you can really get some bleeding from that. And then, of course, here's our indirect space with the inferior epigastric vessels here. And, um, and uh, we have a pretty good uh, dissection there. Next step is uh, putting the mesh in. Um, I've kind of migrated towards using a, a lightweight uh, polypropylene mesh, but there are a lot of mesh options out there, and uh, I don't have a, a strong opinion one way or the other, but this is what worked well in our hands. There was one recent study that suggested a little bit lower incidence of chronic pain in lightweight <coughs> versus heavyweight mesh. The other thing that's important about is the angle on this port. So what I do, oftentimes we have a medical student with us running the camera. So uh, we make sure that we have a straight shot through that cannula into the space. Because what can happen, if you pull the, the, the scope out and that cannula tilts up, you may be pointing right into the peritoneum, and I have put that mesh right through the peritoneal cavity before. You've done a beautiful dissection, everything's great, now suddenly you've got a big hole. And it, and it, and it gets to be a much more uh, difficult problem to, uh, to uh, recover from there, and you've got a big hole in the peritoneum you've got to close. So keep that angle so that it's, you've, you're going right through the open space into the preperitoneal space. And then I think the other uh, area that sometimes we see our trainees struggle with is positioning the mesh. Um, the first thing is to kind of get it oriented uh, properly. And then um, I'm sure you have your own techniques for getting this position, but kind of picking up on the edge of the central portion and kind of flattening out the inferior margin. And then um, some of the meshes are marked with a medial boundary, which uh, can be uh, helpful, some of the ones that are form-fitting, if you will, like this particular one. And just like Dr. Schweitzberg showed, you want to have this nice and flattened out. You don't want any wrinkles in it. And you want to make sure that you've covered all uh, spaces. And generally, I kind of aim for about two-thirds, one-third, two-thirds above uh, the pubis and the key structures, and then one-third uh, below. Um, the other point that I would add is that I think it's probably not too bad to have a little bit of residual fat. You don't want to leave a cord lipoma, but a little residual fat out over the area of the cord vessels and the nerves so that the mesh, uh, so that those are not skeletonized and the mesh gets fibrosed uh, into them. And then I do a fixed mesh. I know uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, different opinions about this, but I do. I try to use a uh, limited uh, amount of fixation. I typically do use a spiral tacker, uh, but have used uh, 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 other tacking devices as well, and maybe even disposable devices are appropriate. And here, I think this is key. We're not in the bone. We're just above the pubis. If you put those tacks in the bone, uh, uh, there's a, uh, an increased risk that you may get a periostitis and chronic pain for that. So I think that's another key element of avoiding uh, chronic pain postoperatively, in the addition to the points that Dr. Schweitzberg made about not putting any tacks uh, uh, posteriorly and inferiorly out here in the area where the nerves lie. So uh, this is on the other side, and um, I think maybe this, this was even this was the, even the same patient who uh, 
uh, was uh, good enough to have a direct hernia on one side and an indirect on the other. So uh, really pretty easy. You've got this pseudo sac, and you've just got to peel this fat completely out of there and not leave anything uh, that will herniate back up into the space. Um, and that was a pretty short uh, clip, but usually it really doesn't take very long to dissect that direct hernia out. And I'd probably get a little bit of this fat off uh, here uh, near, the, um, near the other structures um, off of this medial side as well. The inferior epigastrics are going to be uh, right over there. And here's just the view with the uh, direct hernia. And uh, inferior ep ep epigastrics are there. So uh, we actually use a different mesh on this other side, and um, this is uh, another lightweight polypropylene mesh. Um, and uh, one of the keys, I think, when you're doing bilaterals, uh, I like to have a little bit of overlap, not a lot, but a little bit of overlap of the mesh in the middle, and then attack mesh to mesh. And I think that makes it much less likely that something else is going to move or, or, uh, or slip. So now our mesh is well positioned over the all potential hernia spaces there, and then uh, we're going to fix these together. Um, the other thing about uh, doing this part of the fixation, um, for the, for the uh, stapling where it's not next to the pubis, then uh, your other hand is on the abdominal wall, and I try to get that abdominal wall almost in perpendicular to the uh, tacker. Just get it a nice little firm application and then fire the tacker and let it do its job, okay? Uh, a lot of times people want to shove that thing in and then it's, it kind of skies off to the side. And if you push in too hard, especially if uh, the patient's not very heavy, you can actually dimple the skin uh, by doing this. And so you, it's all in the having kind of a little bit of a firm but light, uh, lightly firm touch to this. And then uh, the last thing at the end is as you evacuate the space, um, keep the inferior margins of the mesh flattened out so that the peritoneum doesn't slip up underneath it, and, um, and then you're basically done. Um, sometimes you get a significant pneumoperitoneum. I would say probably 30 to 50% of the time that we will see that, and oftentimes uh, if there, I think there's very much gas in the peritoneal cavity. I'll just take a varus needle, pop it, angling cephalad through the posterior rectus sheath that you've got, and just take uh, a few seconds to decompress the gas out of the peritoneal cavity before I leave uh, the operating room. And then, of course, the closure, uh, the only thing we close fascia-wise is the anterior rectus sheath, just was with a couple of O-gauge absorbable uh, sutures. Um, and then, uh, finally, just a word about uh, uh, postoperative care. Um, probably the most common uh, annoying complication after this operation is urinary retention. Um, and in our hands, it's been about 4%. Uh, and we've had some education we've had to do with our team, particularly our uh, anesthetists and our recovery room staff. Um, they tend to hold people around until they, they can pee afterwards. And so they'll give them 1,200 of fluid for a 30-minute case in the OR, and then they go to recovery room, and if they haven't peed in 45 minutes, the nurses start pouring fluids and making them drink. And before you know it, uh, they can't pee. They've got uh, 600 ml in their bladder, and, it, and it's too late. And then they bought a catheter for a couple of days. So uh, we try to really minimize fluid, uh, IV fluids in the operating room and in the recovery room to lower that risk of urinary retention. Um, in terms of activity, uh, I tell people your normal light activities for the first 10 to 12 ways, and then just progress according to comfort level after that. But some people are probably more aggressive about post-op activity than that. I see them back in uh, three to four weeks. And uh, that's usually it. So um, I'd like to thank uh, Sages for the opportunity to uh, show these techniques. And I'm sure there are a lot of you out there that do this much better than I do. So I look forward to the discussion. Thank you.